Hi, Mystery Recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an American sci-fi television show called For All Mankind. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. The show is set in a parallel universe and it begins in the year 1969. Everyone around the world is taken aback by the first moon landing. However, it's actually the Soviets who have accomplished this. The people at NASA are in shock as they watch a Soviet cosmonaut become the first person to step foot on the moon. Come, comrade. Free cheese for everyone. The next day, at a meeting, the chief of the astronaut office, Deke Slayton, reveals that Apollo 11, America's latest attempt to send a man to the moon, is scheduled to launch in two weeks. So, he orders astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins to continue with their training as planned. However, the news of the Soviets sending the first man to the moon has shaken the morale of the astronauts. They appear distraught. So, Deke decides to let them take the weekend off. The astronauts appreciate this and go to a bar, which is famous among NASA employees. There, a reporter approaches astronauts Ed Baldwin and his crewmate Gordo Stevens. It turns out the two were crew members of the Apollo 10 mission, whose aim was to travel close to the moon's surface and observe the landing conditions for Apollo 11. They are now set to go on the Apollo 15 mission. The reporter pesters Ed and Gordo about losing to the Soviets and makes snide remarks about them returning back to Earth without landing on the moon. This upsets a drunk Ed, and he goes on a rant against NASA. He reveals that the space organization is scared of taking risks after the first Apollo mission tanked and resulted in an accident that killed all the crew members. The scene then cuts to the NASA HQ where the main administrator, Thomas Paine, astronaut office chief Deke, and director of manned spacecraft center, Werner von Braun, demand answers from a CIA agent as the American spy agency failed to warn NASA about the Soviet moon landing. In the CIA's defense, the agent replies that they reported two unmanned rocket launches but they turned out to be manned. Desperate to get an American on the moon as soon as possible, Thomas asks if they could move up the launch of the Apollo 11, but Von Braun rejects the idea. The next day, Ed's earlier comments about NASA go viral. Viral. It's in the news. This obviously doesn't sit well with the superiors, so Deke reprimands him and reveals that Von Braun has decided to remove him from the Apollo 15 mission. Instead, Ed will be assigned to a normal office job. The latter tries to protest the decision, but Deke won't hear any of it. It. Following this, the story skips forward one month, and Apollo 11 is finally ready for launch. At Mission Control, flight director Gene Kranz gives a motivational speech to all the staff and reminds them that the outcome of the mission will shape America's future for space travel. Moments later, Apollo 11 finally launches, and the entire nation watches tensely from their homes. To everyone's delight, the craft safely reaches space and ultimately the moon's orbit. Afterwards, Neil and Buzz make their way towards the moon's surface, while Michael stays behind in lunar orbit. As Ed watches the mission from the bar, his wife Karen attends a watch party hosted by Deke's wife Marge. The two get to talking and Marge explains that Deke could put Ed back in the Apollo 15 mission if he publicly states that he was misquoted by the reporter. However, Karen mentions that duty, honor, and the truth matter a lot to her husband and he would never agree to it. Elsewhere, Neil and Buzz slowly approach the moon's surface and prepare for landing. However, as they get closer, they struggle to find a good spot spot. This makes the two panic, so they are forced to make an abrupt landing. Because of this, the mission control loses telemetric connection and all other means of communication with Apollo 11. Mission control, that's one small step for man- <laughs> Several hours pass by, and after not hearing from Apollo 11, Von Braun concludes that the spacecraft is likely to have crashed. They even ask Michael, who is in orbit, to return back to Earth. But just then, the mission control receives a transmission from Neil, who lets them know that Apollo 11 has successfully landed on the moon. This sends all of the NASA staff into a state of ecstasy. They start to celebrate while Neil hoists the stars and stripes and becomes the first American on the moon. After a while, Neil and Buzz wrap up their mission on the moon and reunite with Michael in orbit. Orbit. Then, the three of them set course for Earth, and they didn't even need Stanley Kubrick's help. Two months pass by, and Ed has become fed up with his desk job. One day, he confronts Deke and asks him to reinstate him as a member of the Apollo 15 crew. However, the boss is still unwilling to take him back. Later, NASA Administrator Thomas Paine conducts a meeting with the other high-ranking officials, saying that he has some bad news. He suspects that the Soviets are planning to set up a lunar base on the moon, having already lost one race to them. 
them, Thomas is adamant on avoiding another humiliation. So, he orders Von Braun to quickly take initiative and build the first military outpost on the moon before the Soviets do. Thomas also mentions that the order has come directly from President Richard Nixon himself. I am not a crook. I'm a space man. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's revealed that Von Braun used to work in Germany, where he developed the V-2 rockets. These rockets were used by the Germans in World War II, and they claimed the lives of hundreds and thousands of innocent people. Therefore, Von Braun rejects the President's orders, stating that he doesn't want to turn space travel into another battlefield. Later, he talks to his disciple, Margot Madison, who is an engineer at NASA. She appears to have an interview with the flight director, Gene, for a position in mission control. Unfortunately, the interview does not go as planned, and Margot leaves the office in frustration. She is certain that she will not get selected. However, the next day, Von Braun enters her office and proudly announces that she is the first woman to ever be in mission control. Hearing this, Margot becomes excited and hugs him tightly. In the next scene, Ed is approached by Administrator Thomas Paine and a congressman. The latter gives Ed a chance to get back into the Apollo 15 program, but only if he does them a favor. Ed will have to bring Von Braun down by falsely testifying in front of the committee, who are investigating NASA's failures. Ed is hesitant about the offer, as although he doesn't see eye to eye with Von Braun. He still respects him. The congressman simply asks him to think about it, revealing that even the president wants it to happen. A few weeks later, Ed is seen at the Congress hearing in Washington, D.C. Surprisingly, instead of framing Von Braun, he takes the fall for the Apollo 10 mission, much to the congressman's dismay. Later, he resigns from NASA and decides to re-enlist in the Navy. Nevertheless, the hearing committee manages to corner Von Braun by bringing up his work association with Nazi Germany. Von Braun expresses extreme regret over the mis use of his work by the Third Reich, and claims that it has no relevance to his work at NASA. In response, the congressman reveals various photos and hard proof that Von Braun had also been a part of the SS, the Nazi secret police which was known for its brutality against Jews. This proves to be the final nail in the coffin for Von Braun, and he is ultimately relieved of his duties at NASA. I am innocent, please. I love the Jews. The scene then cuts to the launch of the Apollo 12 mission, which is set to explore the moon and find a suitable site for the lunar base. The same day, Deke pays Ed with some good news. After the termination of Von Braun, the new director has decided to reinstate him back into the Apollo 15 mission. The news elates Ed, as it has always been his dream to do something for his country. As the two continue talking, Karen arrives there and asks them to turn on the news. Surprisingly, the news reports that the Soviets have sent another spacecraft on the moon, and this time, a female Russian cosmonaut has successfully stepped foot on the moon, making her the first woman ever to achieve such a feat. The Americans are livid at the achievement, and with pressure mounting on them, they make it their ultimate goal to set up a lunar base before the Soviets. Therefore, Gene and Deke decide to also assign Apollo missions 13 to 15 to survey potential sites for a lunar base. Shortly after, NASA Administrator Thomas Paine enters the room and informs the two that the President now wants a woman on the moon. This is a problem for NASA, as it doesn't have any female astronauts. However, Thomas suggests the names of two potential candidates Molly Cobb and Patty Doyle. Both of them were part of the now-defunct Mercury 13 project, whose aim was to send women to space before it got cancelled in the early 60s. Deke takes both women into consideration, and he is presented with more potential candidates, including Danielle Poole, a NASA engineer. Later, Thomas tells Deke that the president has floated an idea to send Gordo Stevens to space with his wife Tracy, who is also a former pilot. Deke is hesitant about the idea, but Thomas forces him to get on board. Later, Deke visits Gordo's residence and briefs the couple about the proposal. To his surprise, they love the idea and accept it without hesitation. Upon seeing Gordo unusually excited, Tracy gets suspicious and it's then revealed that Deke had offered him a guaranteed slot on the Apollo 15 mission if he managed to convince his wife to undergo astronaut training. Following this, we are taken to the year 1970. Tracy and 19 other female candidates enter their astronaut training class. Deke introduces himself and reminds the ladies that it will be a very rigorous training. All of them will be graded, and the ones with the best results will proceed to the next stage of the program. The course starts, and Tracy in particular has difficulties keeping up with the other candidates. She continuously ranks last, as the number of candidates drops to 10. Tracy also starts considering dropping out from the program, and this results in a heated argument between Gordon and her. He tries to convince her that it is a golden opportunity, but Tracy believes that he is only doing this for himself. In the next scene, we are taken to a NASA meeting, where they are discussing some pictures of the moon taken by a satellite. The pictures reveal the 
possibility of the presence of ice. There's also a little man in there. Jean mentions that water on the moon could change everything. Similarly, an engineer emphasizes that they may be able to drink the water, grow plants, and even make rocket fuel. Maybe even get superpowers like in their Marvel comics. However, this cannot be confirmed, and Ed mentions that they will find out more about it on the Apollo 15 mission. After the meeting, Thomas asks Deke about the female astronaut training program, and the latter reveals that he has set up desert training for the women. This is because he wants to prepare them for a potential scenario if they botch their landing from space into unknown territory. At the desert survival training, Deke briefs the women about their next test. They will have to reach a certain destination in the desert, and everyone will be graded and timed on their individual performances. Soon, the test begins, and all the women begin their journey under the scorching hot sun. After hours of walking, Tracy notices that a fellow candidate named Ellen has injured her ankle. Without any hesitation, she tends to her wounds and slowly makes her way to the finish line with Ellen, sacrificing her own mission. That was a Chad move, a Harry Potter-ass move, you know? Meanwhile, Mercury 13 alumni Molly and Patty reach the finish line before anyone else. Tracy and Ellen are the last ones to make it, much to the astonishment of Deke, who is surprised by Tracy's generosity. The next day, the names of the remaining five candidates are announced, and to everyone's surprise, Tracy and Ellen have made it on the list, along with Patty, Danielle, and Molly. Shortly after, Deke calls Tracy into his office and compliments her on her instinct and guts, but he also mentions that guts alone isn't enough. She needs to be competent and selfish. Saying this, Deke gives Tracy an option to voluntarily withdraw her name from the program. However, she refuses, stating that she is in all the way and wants to be an astronaut badly. On the 200th day of the training program, Ed takes the five remaining candidates to a military base and introduces them to a Lunar Exploration Module, aka LEM Simulator, which can emulate the flight dynamics of the Apollo spacecraft. Here, the candidates will be performing basic takeoff and landing maneuvers. Tracy is the first to enter the LEM. Half an hour later, as Gordo drives by the military base, he notices an ominous cloud of black smoke emerging from inside the base. Worried, Gordo rushes to the base, where he discovers that Patty crashed the module, because of which she has passed away. The incident devastates the remaining four women so much that they start considering to leave the program altogether. One day, a former astronaut named John Glenn visits Deke at his office in NASA HQ. It turns out he was the first American to enter space. John advises Deke to cancel the women's astronaut project, as he opines that it is best for the future of NASA. I'm old-fashioned, you see, and I don't like women. <laughs> Deke, however, refuses to do so, as he has trained the female astronauts continuously for almost a year. Later, at a NASA meeting, Gene reveals that satellite images show that a Soviet spacecraft has crashed on the moon, which has claimed the life of at least one cosmonaut. Although the Soviets have kept the mission and the incident under wraps, the CIA suspects that they were trying to set up a lunar base near the alleged ice formations. This makes NASA realize that the Soviets are again one step ahead. After the meeting, Thomas approaches Deke inside his office and informs him that the women's training program has been cancelled by the higher authorities, much to his dismay. The scene then cuts to a surprise press conference at the NASA HQ. There, Deke speaks to the media and announces that Danielle, Ellen, Molly, and Tracy are the first women to successfully pass NASA's required astronaut training and introduces them as astronauts. This makes the reporters very confused and happy at the same time. Later, Deke visits Ed and informs him that he has decided to replace Gordo with Molly as the crew of the Apollo 15 mission. Ed is not pleased with the removal of his friend, but Deke forces him to have dinner with his new crewmates, Molly and Frank Sedgwick, the third Apollo cosmonaut. Expectedly, Gordo is devastated by the news, and he returns home drunk. This initially infuriates Tracy, but when she learns about his dismissal from the Apollo 15 mission, she immediately comforts him. Meanwhile, during her training for the Apollo 15 mission, Molly gets into an argument with her new crewmates, Ed and Sidgwick, because of her stubbornness. When Margot learns about it, she reprimands Molly and reminds her that she is an astronaut, so she has to be perfect in every aspect. This involves being social and cooperative. Fortunately, Molly takes the feedback well, and she corrects her ways. The scene then skips to the day of the Apollo 15 launch, where the three crew members, Ed, Sedgwick, and Molly, are strapped into the rocket. As soon as it takes off, Deke gets a call from the president, who congratulates him on the launch. However, he also warns Deke that if Molly screws up, he will face the consequences. Check out part two on Mystery Recapped. I am not a crook.